Okay, welcome everyone to the Analytic Mind podcast. Uh, it's been a while since I did my last podcast, so I'm really excited to get back into it. We've got an awesome guest. Um, welcome, uh, Shashank Kalanithi. Um, hopefully, I've got that right. I know I probably I probably butchered it a little bit. Maybe you can <laughs> refine it for me. But um, hey, let's just get started. Why, why don't you introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do, and then we can just just jump into it. How about that? Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me on, Sam. So my name is Shashank Kalanithi, so pretty close. Um, and I am a senior data analyst working out of Seattle, Washington in the United States. I work for uh, Nordstrom, which is a North American fashion retailer. So we operate mostly in Canada and the United States, um, heavily biased towards the United States, of course. Um, I have a degree in chemistry. And then, uh, you know, after that, got into the analytics space just kind of randomly. So the original plan was to go become a doctor. Um, didn't really have much of an interest in that, honestly, but I ended up getting the chemistry degree anyways. And then after that, I happened to randomly get a job in uh, analytics and then just found that it was a, a great field that hit um, a large number of th the things I was looking for in a career. Um, it, it was mentally challenging. There was a great opportunity to build out technical skills, um, such as coding and stuff like that, which I found very interesting. And um, it tapped into my natural desire to analyze and exp uh, find explanations for different phenomena in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so how did you end up at, at, at Nordstrom? Nordstrom's obviously huge in, in, in North America. Um, and so, so how did you um, end up there and, and maybe give us an outline of um, what, are the, what are the interesting things that are going on there in, in terms of data science and, um, and, and, and in the analytics space? Yeah, so I um, so like I said, I graduated with a degree in uh, chemistry, and then I got a uh, internship at a company called Interstate Batteries, a great company, a uh, privately held company, and it's the largest lead acid distributor, uh, lead acid battery distributor in North America. So basically, car batteries. Um, and after that, I, I picked up a lot of skills over there. Moved to a different company, CSC Service Works. They do uh, um, they manage laundry machines. So if you live in an apartment in the United States and you have a laundry room, chances are you're using a CSC laundry machine um, because they are by far the biggest player in that space. And then I was uh, looking to try and go to a bigger enterprise. So both those companies were great, um, but they were what you call like mid-sized enterprises. I think revenue was uh, sub 3 billion for each of those. So like 2 billion for uh, interstate, some like one point something for uh, CSC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, you know, I wanted to go to the West Coast. The uh, idea was there's this um, professor I listened to, Scott Galloway. He's a professor of marketing at the uh, NYU Stern School. Um, I know him well, yeah. I listened to, <laughs> to his podcast, The Pivot. Yeah. And well, really funny guy, right? Um, and he, he had this thing where he like kind of gave advice where he says like, you know, if you want to be successful, right, here's my advice to you. And what he said was, there are a couple of things you need to do. Like, like he says, you know, take two things that don't normally go together, become good at those things and combine them together. So some like fashion analytics or something like that, right? And um, the second thing he said was, if you want to be the best at something, you have to go where the best people are practicing. Um, in the tech space, there are probably three places in America where, you're, where you'll see the best, play, uh, best people, like um, the, the best employees, basically. Uh, San Francisco, obviously number one, like the Bay Area in general, um, obviously number one. Uh, Seattle is probably... Uh, number two. And the third one, a lot of people would say Austin. I would actually argue that it's probably New York City. Um, New York doesn't get talked about that much in relation to being a major tech hub, but that's because they have so many other things going on as well that, you know, the, the tech is one of the many world leading industries they have. So of those three cities, I got a job in Seattle first with Nordstrom. Um, and I started as a senior data analyst. I um, my skill set includes you know SQL, Tableau, Python, stuff like that. I, I love coding; it's a lot of fun for me. Uh, I'm actually um, you can't really see it on the camera, but I'm running a web scraper on the side uh, for a project I'm working on currently, like a personal one. Um, and at Nordstrom, we do a lot of stuff. I work in a team called Strategic Analytics, which is there for the purposes of answering questions that executives might have, um, and uh, people like the director level up usually. Uh, ask us questions and ask us, okay, like, how does this stuff work? How does that stuff work? Uh, whenever earnings calls come in, they may have some other questions about how certain phenomena um, tracked uh, after the earnings call. Um, so working for a public company obviously has a, a, a lot of like just interesting stuff going on with it. And currently we're doing a couple of projects, one of which is building out this automated machine learning platform that's supposed to 
augment the capacity or the capability of the individual data analyst. That way you can throw a lot of the stuff you'd ask a data analyst at the platform and it should be able to answer 60% of that question by itself, leaving the other 40% for a data analyst to check and verify, which would greatly augment the capacities of our team. So um, answering questions, uh, you know, your regular, you know, data analyst stuff and building on machine learning platforms. That's what I do um, at Nordstrom. Awesome. Oh, that's really Really fascinating. I, one one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about all of those different cities within the states. I mean, I'm, um, we're really um, you know getting down to the nitty gritty. I mean, they're all fantastic places, I'm sure. You know, and uh, a lot of talented people, and there's many more talented people everywhere um, in the states. So um, I think uh, you know, even though you the, 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 there's def definitely what you would consider a top tier, I think there's you know there's still some fantastic organizations and places places everywhere. I mean, I myself used to work in um, uh, Southern California, and I mm -hmm. worked at a, a financial a large financial firm called Pimco. Um, one of the biggest bond funds in in the world, um, and you know that's in Southern California in in Orange County. Um, and so you know there's just talent everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Fantastic people everywhere. Um, but yeah, look, it, it's Seattle's obviously where a lot of the where Amazon and Microsoft are based are, aren't they? So there's there's just tremendous talent just everywhere you look um, around you. Would that be right? Yeah, I, I would argue you can be talented anywhere in the world, um, especially in a field like this. The great thing about it is it's so remote friendly. That you can go anywhere in the world, you'll find incredibly, incredibly talented people. I'm, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Um, not what you would think of as a tech city, but there are some incredibly talented analysts from Dallas, Texas. I think the advantages you have to these other cities is the uh, number of people there. Because I, I mean, you know, like I, you know, the Amazon headquarters is right next to me, and there's probably like 10,000 people in that building right there. Um, and then, you know, my building is the building I live in is basically only Microsoft and Amazon people. Um, so I, I think that if you are looking for like the like extremely large numbers of those people, then you know there there are a couple of cities in America that specialize in that. But I would also say you know one disadvantage to that, right? Uh, and I started to notice it like living over here, is that you can get really sucked into this bubble, um, where you, it, it's what you call the tech bubble, right? And it's basically uh, only tech people that like only know software engineering, product development, project management, data analysis data science, like the really like tech focused fields uh, or tech focused like jobs. And I think that it can create a really big blind spot with someone if you don't make it an effort to like diversify and find people that do other stuff. And that's where I think cities like, or like, you know, Southern California, like, I mean, Southern California is a very interesting place, right? Because specific, more so than probably any region in America, it's a basically like, it's almost like a country within a country, right? Like Southern California is not just LA. It's it's like all the surrounding areas, which are very intimately connected with one another. Uh, and you have some like, you know, like a couple 10 million in that area. It's crazy how big it is. Um, I think, well, California is the 11th largest economy in the world, I think. Something yeah, like yeah. And, and just that, like just the Los Angeles metropolitan areas, economy is bigger than South Korea's, I believe. And by extension, um, uh, well, Russia as well. Um, so, you know, that, that gives you a idea of just how heavy hitting it is. And I think another way, you know, that's the, the advice I gave earlier is, this, you know, Scott Galloway's opinion, and that's like one way to go about it. But I think if you go to like a city, or if you go to like Southern California, you'll meet so many different people, along with many talented tech people, that you, you will probably like run into some really interesting ideas as to, you know, say you want to start a business with analytics or something, or find ways to apply analytics to spaces that it's not normally applied to. Um, so I think there's an advantage to that as well. It's just more dispersed, isn't it, as well? Like um, when you've got um, city centers, because California is just like so spread out. And mm -hmm. when you've got city centers where everyone in the same building is working at the, the top end of, of tech, like you, you're going to get this serendipity, you know, uh, effect where everyone's sort of knocking into each other and discussing all the latest and greatest things. So mm -hmm. there's sort of network effect benefits there. I'll tell you, tell you an interesting stat. Um, Orange County, where I worked um, a few years back, its economy is larger than the whole of New Zealand. So um, wow. I, always, I always found that um, quite fascinating, you know, and I think, I think there's, I mean, I, there's probably like, if Orange County is actually quite a, quite a big area as well. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's well over a million, maybe, maybe 2 million people just, just in that sort of that area. Um, and, you know, there's just some huge companies that obviously make a huge impact on the, on the economy there. And, and then that, that equates to far more than <laughs> the whole of New Zealand, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, anyway, so look, let's, let's, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to jump into a little bit more about some, 
sort of like projects that, you know, and one of the ones you've already mentioned, like this augmentation of your analytics, I'm, I'm fascinated to learn about how you're actually doing that. Like what is, um, like what is the concept of like how, how, how did you come up with that idea? How is that being implemented? This is something that I, to be honest, have not really um, heard of this, this augmentation concept um, around data analysts. Um, so yeah, really keen to learn a little bit more about, about that project. Yeah, so as much as I can go into it detail wise, it kind of goes into, um, I'd say maybe two or three basic concepts, right? So there is, like, what does a data analyst do? Let's, let's first break down the role of a data analyst, right? Um, there are many different data analysts out there, but I, and, and I'm going to pick on specifically like what, you know, I've done in my career and what like, you know, data analysts kind of in my space, in my world do, right? Usually, a stakeholder, a stakeholder just uh, being a keyword for a business person who doesn't pull their own data for the most part, they will either want to start a new, a new initiative um, or track the uh, performance of something that's already been going on. So at Nordstrom, there's a couple of things, right? Um, we are a company that differentiates ourselves based on our customer service. Uh, we operate at the upper end of um, d- department store retail in America, not the highest end, but uh, I'd say like right below that usually. And uh, in that end, we have customers who, you know, ask for a great service. So they'll come in. There's a couple of services we have in store. And one thing that, um, for example, our stakeholders want to know is how much can we attribute these services to, you know, like uh, customer loyalty or something like that, for example, right? Another one might be someone launches a new program to, you know, better connect with customers. And then we need to track the performance of that program and say, okay, we can assign like this dollar value of um, incremental um, spend per customer, associated with that program. Incremental spend per customer just meaning um, how much more are they spending than what they normally would have spent had this program not existed. Um, You know, incremental spend, marginal spend, you know, it's all basically the same thing. And so that's kind of what a data analyst normally does, right? And how do we actually go about that process? We will get the requirements from the stakeholder. Uh, The stakeholder will have a series of questions and then we'll go to a SQL database and we'll start plumbing the depths of that SQL database trying to find the data, right? Um, And that can, there can be a couple of ways we get to that, right? Either we know where the data is and we can just go ahead and get it, or we don't know where it is. We usually have to ask someone else, um, hey, do you know where this data is? Or we look at documentation and try and find it. And then after that, we need to start organizing the data into a format that is uh, readily available for that stakeholder. And then perform maybe statistical analyses on it, uh, clean it up a little bit more, put it into a Tableau dashboard, a lot of uh, presentation about it. So, you know, you'll see there's three basic steps here. The first step, go ahead and get um, the requirements from the stakeholder. The second step, go ahead and find uh, and extract the data. Um, The third step is basically presenting, well, I'd say the third step is like analyzing it. And the fourth step is presenting it, right? Mm -hmm. This tool that we're building out, its kind of purpose is to allow it, allow solve a couple of problems we have, right? Like, so one problem we have is that where is the data? So we're creating these repositories of very clean code um, that is not only, it doesn't only exist, but it it can be uh, put, um, ripped apart and put together by a machine, right? So for example, we have this uh, snippet that'll say, okay, this is what, this is how you define demand and this is how you pull it out, right? And another one that says, this is how you define sales and this is how you pull it out. And another one that says, okay, this is a a filter you can use to filter Nordstrom stores from Nordstrom.com. And then you write some Python code that'll take those individual snippets and kind of automatically put them together based on some natural language processing by someone typing into a Slack bot, I want to know demand at the Nordstrom store as of yesterday. Um, so you, you take that in, you, nav- you, you NLP it basically, um, and then you can put together these snippets programmatically in order to create a query. Now you've removed an analyst who may have taken two or three hours to uh, figure that out. Uh, and the machine can do it in you know five to 10 minutes. Um, the code may not be very efficient, but it's modular, right? Like modularity and efficiency, you know, are, um, they don't always oppose each other, but many times they do, you know, um, it's not the most efficient code, but who cares? It's way faster than using an analyst time to do that. We'd rather pay for compute time than to use an analyst time. Right. Um, cause say you're paying an analyst, you know, six figures, right. That's, uh, what a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's two for 2000, um, hours. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're talking $50 an hour. Um, you know, if, if your compute costs less than a hundred, uh, costs less than $50 an hour, you're saving money, you know, and that doesn't even take into account the uh, marginal increase you get in what that analyst could be doing now with their time. So, you know, that's part of it. Another part would be like, um, automating large parts of the machine learning life cycle, the model or the modeling life cycle, I should say, um, by having like, uh, you know, 
hyperparameter tuning and everything kind of like done for it. So it's kind of like an aut automated ML. Basically, we're, we're kind of creating our own version of that. And like another one would be like an automated exploratory data analysis tool. So uh, auto EDA, where you insert uh, a data frame, a table basically, and it will analyze this data from 30 different angles. Um, and then uh, again, programmatically, and then spit out all those analyses. And then over time, uh, we train it to get better and better at doing these things. So all of the, of the kind of like grunt work tasks that an analyst does are now being handed off to the machine. And maybe the machine will spit out like, um, you know, a hundred good insight, a hundred bad insights and two good ones, right? Like it'll, it's kind of dumb, right? So it'll like compare these things that are not supposed to be compared, for example. Um, but, you know, you, it, that's okay, given that we've like expanded the capacity of what an analyst can do now. And we're allowing our stakeholders to like kind of do this thing on their own. And then, you know, I mean, maybe you get to a point where you're programmatically creating tablet dashboards. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, there's so many parts to that that I'd like to, yeah, <laughs> into. I mean, I guess the key theme to me there is that you're just making the data discovery so much more efficient, right? So instead of every single person having to know how to write SQL codes or having to know how to do use an ETL tool or something or something or something similar um, to build up their analysis, they can get to that, you know, analysis part, the the um, visualizing of the data a lot quicker. That's mm -hmm. that, that's a big part of that, right? Um, so that's really quite interesting. So. I've never, um, well, I have heard of it actually before, but how, how uh, if we get down to the nitty gritty, how, do, how are you stitching together? Um, is, there, is there some great tools that you can use that can stitch together these queries, these data queries um, that can reach back into your, your raw data source and then bring the curated data based on someone's natural language input? So the natural language processing part is not the part I'm working on, so I can't comment too much on that. But the query stitching is a, um, that's an ongoing thing we're trying to figure out. So we, the way we've kind of thought about it is, the, the way we, we've kind of thought about this whole project, right, is that kind of think about what does a data analyst do? How do you modularize what we do down to replicable steps, right? Um, so for example, we, I, I guess kind of the mentality you go about it with is that after we heard this task was coming up, we would um, go ahead and continue our regular day jobs, right? And like, you know, get do all our analyses and everything. But now we start recording, okay, what did I do? Then what did I do after that? Then what did I do after that? And then you start to find out that like a lot, uh, while the work is very um, creative and very like, there's a lot, there's many human components to it, right? Um, large sections of it can be modularized. Uh, the best example would be, our, a query is basically us stitching together a bunch of different uh, columns one by one saying, okay, we want this column, then this column, then this column, and they get aggregated at this level, right? Like at its core, that's what we're doing. There's some complexity associated with like making it efficient, um, you know, being a responsible steward of our databases, but that's kind of how we went about it. I'd say like, how do you modularize the task of being a data analyst? And as far as like stitching together these queries, there's no tool that we're aware of that does that for us. Um, we write our own queries using like, you know, business knowledge that we've accumulated over the years and uh, just write Python code or R code that uh, puts that all together. That's a bit of a debate on the team. Some people like, ha like I'd say maybe like one third of the team are R users and two thirds are Python users. So um, yeah, they're, they're, I don't know, if maybe friction might be a bit of a strong word, but there is definitely difficulty in getting all those components to work together. Right. And so what does the end data analyst get? Is it, do they get some sort of like user form or some like um, in-house app that you've built, which enables them to put all their filters in and then that's how they get their, the, the data scrape or the, the data that they want? I think we'd like to have a UI at the end of the day. Currently, it is a, you either interact with it through a Slack bot or through an API call. Um, so we're uh, putting it out as a managed service into the cloud. And um, then from there, you can query it using like code or something. Um, because it's the easiest way for us to deploy it as quickly as possible. Right. How, how mature do you think the technologies are to automate a lot of the analysis that you would do on data? So you mentioned it just before that it's a bit hidden, hit and miss. And, and to be honest, like from my experience, I have also seen that it's seriously hit and miss um, in terms of the insights you can get out of this automated analysis. Um, but it's no doubt it's the future, right? Like it's going to take out, you know, you, you're, you're going to reduce so much um, time intensive work to get the insights that you want. But, you know, what's your view on the maturity, the maturity of that over the last couple of years? I think that it's gotten 
significantly better. And the funny thing is I kind of feel like the uh, progress that gets made is actually due more to frustration than anything um, where you have a stakeholder asking you for the, you know, like the fifth time, how to like, you know, pull this thing and you're like, I'm in SQL again. I'm just, you know, writing out all this SQL. I don't know about y'all, but like between SQL and Python, I like just coding in Python a lot more. Like obviously they accomplish different tasks, but the tasks associated with coding in Python are just way more interesting to me than whatever I do in SQL. Um, so, you know, I would find any, you know, uh, opportunity I could, I can to automate it. As far as like the progress that's been made in the last couple of years and like kind of where we're headed to, um, for anyone that doesn't know, I have my own YouTube channel every Thursday morning, um, 8 a.m. Pacific time, uh, United States. I run a uh, Q&A basically where I answer any questions that people might have. And one big question that people have is automation going to like render this field obsolete, which is, you know, kind of ties into what uh, uh, you were saying. So the short answer is no, um, not anytime soon as far as I can tell. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that business definitions are very squishy. Um, only the most advanced tech companies, the companies that have been tech companies from like the ground up have all this stuff sorted out in their databases and like ready to go, ready to serve up all the time. Uh, Nordstrom's a fortune 500 company and we don't have that. Um, so, you know, it, we're not talking about like a small company over here. We're talking about one of the biggest companies on the planet. Um, and you're constantly adding, and at the end of the day, analytics is always going to be a secondary concern to the business itself, right? It's not sales. It's not, um, you know, I mean, even, I wouldn't even say IT to an extent where these are like necessary functions for the business to actually exist. Uh, analytics is supposed to take the business as it is uh, and then work with it in order to actually analyze the data. And because of that, a lot of systems aren't designed from the ground up with analytics in mind. And I think that's where automation fails, where uh, data is not tagged correctly. Uh, business definitions are kind of squishy. People define them different ways. Um, columns are uh, named differently in different databases. Data is in different databases. Um, that itself is a big issue, right? Like it, we have something like, you know, a, a couple of databases at Nordstrom and getting access to each one is can be a little bit difficult. Um, you know, companies end up picking uh, what I would call subpar tools. I've worked at companies where uh, the tools they picked were just not that great and they were not uh, the best you could get out there. And because of that, you were always uh, one or two steps behind what was the, the leading and bleeding edge. Um, and I specifically know this because I do consulting on the side um, just you know, to earn a little bit of extra cash. And I've been very lucky to work with one of my clients who uses a uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud platform and a BigQuery specifically, which uh, I personally believe to be one of the best you know, um, systems out there. Like uh, the, the best is probably Snowflake for data warehousing. And then, you know, I'd say Google Cloud is probably close after that. But using that, I'm like, oh, you know, there's a lot of unlock and just the ease by which I can query data using this data warehouse over here. So uh, kind of long story short to answer your question, I would say the fact that analytics is always going to be a secondary concern for a business because it doesn't drive the business. Uh, and that's very important for anyone that wants to get into this field to understand. Um, your job is important when you're not driving the business. Um, it is, you're going to have data that just isn't labeled correctly. And therefore it's going to be hard to automate that, you know, automation works well when stuff is very, very clean in, in like a lab like environment. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, from, from my perspective though, just a contrast that I would say that the analytics function has grown in importance by many organizers of magnitude in the last five to seven years. And mm -hmm. I think it's only going to get more. I mean, if you just look at the trends, if you look at the, the um, competitive advantage that you can mm -hmm. get from better data analysis, better data decision-making, uh, data-related decision-making, a better data culture. Uh, I mean, these are the companies that are going to win. I mean, that's why, you know, Google and Amazon and Microsoft are winning because they are folk really, um, you know, they're the best at this, right? And it's the same with even, even um, less well-known companies. You know, they, they, are, they are winning through data. You know, they're, they're winning through mm -hmm. their, their outperformance and their, and their data functions. And my, you know, that, that's my personal view from, from, from what I've seen and read. Would you, would you concur? I would agree that data is getting a seat at the table as time goes on. Uh, and so, for example, like when I say a seat at the table, right, are you represented by a chief executive? Um, chief data officers are uh, becoming a thing and they're becoming more and more common. When I say it's not like uh, the primary function of the business, right? At the end of the day, uh, the, the question, you know, like, and I think this is a really important question that is just good advice for anyone that works at any company. Uh, make sure you understand the business, right? Everything else is secondary. The business is first, right? Um, 
Walmart makes more money by selling more stuff, you know? Um, and or, well, maybe uh, that's, that's not the best example. Oracle, Oracle. Um, so they sell enterprise software, right? Um, their salespeople are like, like one-to-one related with like, like the better a salesperson does, the more money Oracle makes, right? There's a one-to-one relationship over there. Um, supply chain people at Amazon, the more money they save, the more money the company uh, quote unquote makes, you know, the uh, bigger, the bottom line, just put it that way. Right. Um, I think it's almost, data. It's almost like it's it's sort of seen as um, non-core. Like you can survive as a business without your analytics function, but you couldn't survive as a business without your sales function, for example. And to to speak to uh, that's exactly right. And to speak to your point, I think that if you want to thrive reliably, then you need an analytics function. Um, and the way I see it, why would you want to work at a company that doesn't want to thrive anyways? You know. Um, so I think any company worth its salt is going to invest a lot into analytics. But I do want people to understand that, like. You know, like you like 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 salespeople are the front line of the business. Analytics is a, a support function for most companies. You know, um, yeah. and and that's really important to understand. It's it's important to understand if you're a support function or if you're like a front line function. You know, of the company. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's kind of like um, you could say the same for like human resources or something. Like, mm-hmm. oh, very much so. Yeah, like a company does not live and die by its, by its HR. You know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but you know, in terms of those support functions, I would still say that that the analytics side across all areas within businesses is, is becoming more and more important. Up and down, one hundred percent. Yeah, I'm only in this field because it's growing. You know, um, yeah, for sure. So yeah. it's a great field to be in. No doubt, no doubt. One of the other things um, that you mentioned earlier, that which, I, which I, I think would be interesting to talk about more, is so there are a lot of these uh, legacy issues, right, within mm-hmm. organizations to actually get your data your data function. Uh, working optimally. Um, but I think, you know, I think a lot, like all of us are aware of, like every, everyone in the data field is aware of these things uh, and they um, know that they're, they're, they are difficult to fix sometimes. But in your view, like how would you fix? Like how, what, what, are the, what are the priorities that a company should um, take your, or, or uh, you know, what, what should they prioritize to try and make a dent into these um, challenges? So I think it depends on where your company is, right? So at the companies I've worked at, I would say the main problem is the availability of historical data um, because you can't model without historical data and and usually a pretty substantial amount of it. Um, And the ease of access of that data. So I would say if, let's say you're, you know, taking the 30,000 foot view of it, right? Um, or 10,000 meter, as they say, uh, the the view of it, right? It would be, I would say that it starts off, maybe it doesn't start off, but from an implementation perspective, right? Um, IT infrastructure is absolutely key. Um, If, let's say you had, let's say you run a Fortune 500 company, right? Because it it changes depending on what company you're running at, right? Uh, If you're doing a Fortune 500 company, that means you probably have a lot of data to work with. Um, You've been saving it up for years. And it's stuck in um, ERP systems for the most part, or CRM systems, you know? And what's important to understand for anyone that doesn't know, ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. Uh, and it's basically, it's like the uh, pipelines of your business. It's, it's the data pipeline, the core data pipeline of your business. Um, what are you selling? Who are you selling it to? What are you buying? Who are you buying it from? So suppliers, like all like the really core, like like base level stuff to function, like to keep track of the data in your business, usually gets uh, stored in your ERP systems. Um, and then CRM is, uh, I think is what customer resource management. Um, so that's like, okay, like who are we selling to, you know, how do we keep track of them? Stuff like that. Um, so your most base business data is usually in your ERP system. And the thing is a lot of these databases were not built to analyze data. Um, they're really slow. They're really old. Um, and they were built as transactional databases. Uh, something goes in there. And then like, at some point in time, you can pull it up for a quarterly report. Sure. Fine. You know, like there's really basic reporting functionality inside it. I think the first thing that a company needs to do is uh, figure out its data warehousing solution. Um, you know, I will just go ahead and, you know, on the record and say my, the favorite one I've used so far is Snowflake. I really, really enjoy using it because um, you can dump data from many different sources into it very easily and organize it pretty simply as well. So you, I would say you get a data warehouse first, and then second, you get business leaders from across your organization to start talking about, okay, when I when when all these directors come together and they talk to a VP or they go talk to a, um, uh, an SVP or a C level executive, depending on how many levels are in your business, right? What are we reporting on? What do we want to know more about? 
get all, get together all those metrics, right? Um, and then you'd be surprised how many director level meetings people go in and they have no idea what the data is. They're like, oh yeah, I think sales are trending up. I think sales are over here. I think, you know, this is happening. Um, the way I see it, right? A director should be able to, a director should know exactly what their metrics are on any, uh, every single morning, every single day of the week. They should know exactly what their metrics are. Otherwise, you know, what are they, your analytics function needs a lot of uh, upgrading in my opinion. Um, and you can only do that when you have the data available in the data warehouse, and then you have the um, uh, confluence of um, priorities between the business and the analyst and IT to say, okay, we want these metrics. This stuff needs to go to the data warehouse. How much storage do we purchase? How much compute do we purchase in order to get all this done? Um, and then after that, you you know get your data engineers together, start putting the data in, get data analysts to start cranking out basic reporting. Right, um, start off over there. What, what's the base reporting that you need to get done? Connect Tableau to it, Power BI, whatever your BI solution is. Um, I think with the BI solution, you can basically pick anything. It's all the same, basically. Um, and you, you connect all that together and you have your basic BI reporting. And then from there, you start getting into, okay, like forward looking, how can we do better? What can we do better? What's the, what are the advanced modeling exercises we can do and everything? So um, long story short, you get your data warehouse, right? Get all your data in one place and then start cleaning it bit by bit, making these clean data marks that people can pull data from. Uh, make these clean reports that people can that directors can take to their their meetings. That way, you get upper level management buy in as to oh okay like um, Sam's team, Sam the VP his team is doing really well. Every time I ask Sam a question, he like busts out a report and he knows exactly what's going on. Um, you know, depending on your executives, you may you may have to sell it a different way. I, the uh, one of the companies I worked at, we sold the reporting to them by um, making a Tableau dashboard that can be printed out in PDF format very very quickly. So you get like a kind of a tear sheet basically. Uh, another company I worked at, um, they, the sales department, I created a Tableau dashboard, but it had to be in a um, uh, A4 format um, lengthwise. That way salespeople could like, you know, use it like a tear sheet because they were used to tear sheets, right? Uh, even though dashboards are typically, you know, vertically, I mean, uh, horizontally uh, oriented. Um, but if you work in like a warehousing company, right, you, you go to a warehouse, they don't have widescreen monitors for the most part. They have these like square monitors kind of, um, you know, so it, those small things are things you can do to increase adoption. You need to make your analytical products a joy to use. You know, um, the best products I've ever created were the ones that directors were excited to use, you know, and they, and, and when a director's excited, then, you know, then it's smooth sailing over there. Cause they'll just keep giving you ideas and giving you resources to, you know, execute on those ideas. So. No, those are all up and down the stack really really great points a lot of lot of lot of gold nuggets um and what you just went through one of the things that like comes up in my mind whenever whenever you we talk about the whole sort of cycle of of of, of data and and how to get the most out of your data I, I i always relate it to the sort of mining or the oil and gas industry mm -hmm. where you know you've got this raw material which let's just say that's your data right and you need to, it's, it's just everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. You need to go and dig for it. You need to go and find it. Um, but then you need to extract it and you need to get it into sort of a refinery and you mm -hmm. need to um, get the right um, materials or extract the right things out of it. Um, and that's sort of like your data warehouse, right? Yeah. And then I think there's this really key concept of pipelines, data pipelines. And these data pipelines are what feeds from the data warehouse out to all of your key stakeholders, out to your, um, out to your business functions, out to your key data teams. And what you do with those data pipelines and how, uh, how aware you make people of what is happening with those pipes, so the, the data that it can flow through that pipe, how do you access that data through that pipe? Um, how to create uh, an offshoot of that pipe to get something else. You know, how you construct that within a business, how you organize within the, within a business is such a huge part of the success of um, just em em embedding data more into, into your organization and into your decision-making, you know, the, the culture of decision-making. And so that to me is, is a bit of a missing gap, I see, in a, in a lot, of, lo lot of businesses, old and new, is, um, you know, the, the, the data warehouse solutions are, uh, a dime a dozen. There's, there's there's plenty of them, but then getting that information very efficiently out to the selected um, stakeholders within the business. So, say your sales team, your marketing team, your executives, etc. That can can be improved a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then and then once you once you get it into the the end user, it's it's sort of um, okay. What do you do from a value added perspective? Kind of like what you do with raw materials in the real world, right? It's like 
do you make plastic out of it? Do you use it in um, in in just general fuel, or do you put do you upgrade it to jet fuel? I, I don't know. There's like like lots lots of yeah. derivatives that you can create, um, and that's and that's really where the the analytics part, you know, the the data analytics tool comes into play, whether it's Tableau, Power BI, or w- one of the various other um, other tools that are used out there. So that's that's kind of like how I relate it in my mind, and it's mm-hmm. so it is so aligned. Like if you if you think about it like that, because because I think a lot of um, businesses don't have a concept of what to what to even do what to even do with dashboards. right it can be such right. a daunting task like um do i just create a dashboard and that's the that's the first and only thing i have to do no i think you need to think about a bit more holistically like a mining operation and if you can get that mining operation um working really efficiently up and down the stack you know that's how you're going to win that's how you're going to get a huge competitive advantage well i mean i think i i love the oil and gas um or specifically the oil uh metaphor i, I think it's like easily one of the best metaphors out there, right? Like, cause there's so many ways you can tie it back to the real world, right? So uh, great example. Um, why did the Saudis make the most money off of oil? It, it's not, I mean, they, they do have a, a ton of oil, yes. But specifically the thing about Saudi Arabia is it's all like in a big hole in the ground. Like it's all in like a single hole for the most part, right? Like you can just like, you know, dig something in the middle of, I think it's the Western side of the country. Um, yeah, I think it's a Western side of the country, right? And then you, they ship it over to the East. But like, you just, you know, dig it in, you, you just like, you know, stab a hole in the ground in the Western side of the country and oil starts coming out uh, because there's like just a big like reservoir of it underground. Whereas, uh, for example, Russia, on the other hand, they have a ton of oil as well. It's just covered over, you know, it's just over like, you know, thousands and thousands of square miles of Siberian nothingness. Uh, and so like, w- w- how does this metaphor tie to data, right? Um one is you have 10 different databases, you know, the, the Russia situation, we have 10 different databases where everything's all over the place. Uh, we don't even know what we, what, what exists out there. Uh, what you really want is you want the Saudi situation. You put everything in one data, data warehouse that people can easily access, right? Um, this means getting it out of the ERP systems. Obviously, you know, they're still your transactional systems. You keep them up, but you get them out of the ERP systems, put them into a warehousing solution where it can be quickly and easily accessed. Um, one thing I think people don't pay enough attention to, uh, what's the query time for pulling data out? Obviously, you want people to like write efficient queries and everything. Sure, whatever. But like if if a query takes two minutes longer to run on one system versus another system. I think that like a something that a lot of IT teams don't consider is assuming that we pay a senior data analyst hundred thousand dollars a year uh, and they run like you know ten queries a day and we extrapolate that for the hundred analysts that we hire each at you know hundred thousand dollars per year. How much money are we losing? with analysts just waiting around for queries to run, right? Um, and this might be me, the ground level employee, kind of saying like you know complaining out uh, out to the ether. But I don't know. I feel like it's an important consideration as well. Like query times are important. So the oil and gas thing is super, super uh, relevant. Um, another offshoot of that, Standard Oil, the biggest uh, oil corporation to ever exist at its time, right? The John Rockefeller Corporation. Uh, they didn't make money mining oil. That wasn't how they made the money, right? Um, because mining is a very risky operation. Yeah. Where he found the, where Rockefeller found the best way to make the money was, was to just own all the refining capacity of, you know, the United States. I right. Mean, I, read, I read his. I read. I read his book. It was. It was uh, a very cutthroat um, mentality, but a, a ruthless. It was very ruthless, but it was. It was the way to do it, right? Yeah. It was the refine. It was the refining. Refiners where they where they totally had a monopoly, and and um, I think I think also they um, there was distribution in there as well. They started buying up the, the railways as well, or, or some of the trains. I think from yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Rockefeller, yeah, the Standard Oil is a crazy company to read about but yeah i mean refining is like analysis and data science you know that's uh that's where you want to be at in the field as well like that and then uh, data engineering you know those those are the three like you know jobs in the field that make the most money uh, specifically data science data engineering you know yeah yeah to me it's like one of the things that i always fall back on and that is there's there's just a clear deficiency is this pipeline concept is mm-hmm. there there's you know, I, I think most organizations now have the capability to create a data warehouse you know there's more than enough solutions out there there's a lot of help out there but it's still sometimes getting stuck it's still not piping its way out to the right people in an efficient way and i think that is a a clear segment of your data strategy that you need to be more focused on is how do you just get the data out and and one of the things this sort of just circles back to what you mentioned earlier is that 
you know, you're, you're, you don't want your analysts spending tons of time trying to figure out SQL codes or having mm-hmm. to ask someone for a SQL code to actually get the data. You've got to get the pipe more streamlined to just get that data into the hands of people as quickly as possible. You know, I think natural language is, is, a, is a step in the right direction here, but it's probably not totally there just yet. So you need, you need to find some sort of solution before that really matures um, to get data more efficiently out to out to out to your org. Like I would imagine there is just millions of data points that you guys collect every single day, right? I mean, huge transactional company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, a general analyst isn't going to be able to rock up to um, to the, to the um, sales department or the marketing department and just know straight off the bat like how to get the data, right? So you need to get in front of that. You need to get in front of that challenge, in my view, and find inc- like increasingly simple ways or democratized ways that you can actually get that out to people and get them access to it, whether it's pre-formatted um, SQL queries or, um, you know, being able to just click, uh, um, you know, having, like, like, like you mentioned earlier, like a catalog of SQL queries or a right. catalog of, of, of um, ways to get the data out that you, that, that you want. We taught uh, directors how to use Tableau at uh, my first company. That was extremely helpful. So uh, the uh, engineers would put the data in front of us, the analysts. We would clean all that up and then create these clean data tables. And then we would teach, we, we would show the directors like, you know, oh, here's, we, we create all these reports, right? And then eventually, like I said earlier, right? Uh, the directors were like, oh my God, I can know exactly what's going on on a day-by-day basis. This is crazy, Right. Um, so we're getting buy-in from them, buy-in from them now, buy-in from them now. Um, and then they come back and they're like, okay, Shashank, do these 10 different things. And then obviously I can't do all those 10 things at once. So then the director's like, okay, how do I use this tool? And then we just teach them how to use the tool. And the funny thing is that actually offloads a lot of tasks from us because now the director is doing their own data analysis, at least for the, you know, relatively, uh, uh, more straightforward stuff. And we make sure to give them a little bit, we, we gave them a, a tablet workbook literally called, um, director sandbox, um, where it was a tablet workbook connected to a specific table that we created for them, where they could just like drag and drop stuff and create their own little pivot tables uh, and present it themselves. So you're hundred percent right, Sam, you, you unlock in, insane capabilities when you start uh, democratizing the access to clean data for people. And it's all about the pipelines, like you said, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look, that's a, that's a perfect example. Like if you can get a bunch of directors to, um, and and look, I'm I'm convinced. I mean, we're we're heavy in Power BI at Enterprise DNA, right? So I'm mm-hmm. just relating a lot of this back to Power BI. But if you can get a, a, a senior director, um, you know, able to create their own mini report by dragging and dropping visualizations, because you've done a lot of the back end, you know, back end works to make sure the data is in a um, intuitive format for them to be able to do that. I mean, you can, you, you can get anyone to do it, like anyone. Yeah. If you can get a director, you can get anyone. People are excited to do it. Um, yeah. And it's great, right? Because the, the ad hoc stuff, the stuff that's kind of more boring, in my opinion, right? So you offload that to the director. They do it themselves anyways. Uh, everyone wins. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. So true. What's, um, we're, we're kind of obsessed um, at Enterprise DNA about the automation of analytics. Mm-hmm. Um, because even though there's been just... An, a, a, an exponential increase in the toolings and features out there that that you can use around data now. Um, I mean, it's been quite transformational over the last decade um, you know, from from what we were, you know, in in, the, in early 2010s. Um, you know, most people are still just using Excel 10 years ago. So you know, yeah, been yeah, very, very, very transformational. Um, but I still think there's such a long way to go. Like that's my that's my personal view. That's a view mm-hmm. we hold within Enterprise DNA. Um, there's still a lot of inefficiencies around like how you create dashboards. Sometimes, um, you know, there's some technical challenges around, or there's, there's a lot of skill level deficiency around creating data models and um, creating visualizations, which are compelling that people are actually engaged in. You know, there's a, yep. there's a lot of these little things that we think uh, need to be more automated mm-hmm. um, so that many more users can utilize them um, and create a strong output, uh, output that is going to make a difference. So my, my question to you on that is, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing now that could help that? And, and sort of what are some of the opportunities um, out there uh, to, to do this from what you've seen and, and are seeing now? So one thing that I've noticed is that, or, or one thing that we did in, um, at, at Nordstrom, right, our, our whole thing was that we actually created a, 
what would you call it? A um, standards and best practices community, uh, committee. Um, and automation, uh, I don't know where I read this before, but basically at its core, if you want to automate something, right? Um, you know, let's ignore the fancy ML techniques and like, you know, like natural uh, and, and uh, computers like learn, learning on their own, right? Um, because that stuff can be very difficult to execute. Um, if you want to automate something, then automation only comes after standardization. And so standardization is kind of where we decided to start off. And so you have a great, uh, you brought up a great example, right? Ineffective visuals. So within that committee, right, we have a couple of people, myself included, who are responsible for standardizing the uh, a Tableau format, a Tableau workbook. I mean, Nordstrom's a Tableau company, right? Um, a Tableau workbook that anyone can use to get started with their analyses in um, uh, at the company, right? So they can uh, they know where to put the filters, they know how many filters to use. Uh, they're like like basic formatting things that way. When and and the reason this is important, right? This stuff seems frivolous, right? But it's not. The reason it's important that you have the same colors, it, everything looks standard. You uh, it, it's because directors will go from workbook or notebook to notebook, sorry, workbook to workbook, um, as will other people. And it's it's of the utmost importance that there is as little mental switching or like as little mental capacity used switching your schema to adjust this this workbook created by someone completely different, right? Um, so that's how we standardize that. We standardize colors, um, palettes, everything. And also it makes it easier for people to get the final steps of, you know, getting the workbook production ready by, you know, just standardizing that part for them. Um, queries is another big one. Uh, we have standard um, CICD, so continuous, integra integration, continuous, continuous integration, continuous development um, uh, at our company that we you know, that you're supposed to use if you want to use a Nordstrom platforms, basically. And this means that code across our company is all standardized. Um, SQL queries, we're working on standardizing that now because that is a little bit more complicated to standardize in Python, actually, in my opinion, uh, because you're talking about standardizing like business logic, right? And uh, so I think you're hundred percent right. Automation is kind of automation for the sake of making our lives more interesting. You know, again, like I said, ad hoc queries are kind of boring in my opinion. Uh, I want to actually analyze the data. Um, but if you could automate that stuff, right, that'd be awesome. But that requires you to start off with standardization, which is where I think that's a concrete thing people can do to make a standards and best practices committee at your company. Yeah, look, I, I love that. Here's, here's how I'm going to um, reword that because I, I, I relate it to another great saying I heard before. So maybe we could say automation lies downstream from standardization. And I think that is so true, right? So mm -hmm. true. Like you've got to, if you can build the standards, then the automation will just naturally be able to flow off that because everyone is using the same um, visualization template. Everyone is creating their code in a similar way. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, you, you, you know, from what I've seen um, through a lot of our client engagements, you know, that is an oversight. It's a massive oversight when when a lot of analytics um, implementations occur, no matter what technologies you use, is um, too too bought into the self service side of, um, of 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 analytics. You've got to have standards to make that self service work and to mm -hmm. optimize it to make it really really effective and and um, and optimized. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, no, I I think that's definitely the right like method to go about it. Um, there's a really funny meme I saw the other day where basically it was a bunch of cavemen uh, dragging a sled with square wheels on it, right? Um, and this guy comes up with a circular wheel and he's like, guys, I have an improvement. And the uh, cavemen are like, not right now, Tom, we're too busy. Um, you know, pull. And, and, and that's kind of the, that's the thing you have to fight against uh, whenever you're talking about stuff like this, right? Because uh, you have 10,000 things to do. This is not directly value added to the business immediately in the sense that like, you know, go, like taking the time, standardizing stuff, making the standard template and everything. Um, you can go to your director and say, I did this and not all directors will be like, oh yes, this is going to help improve the business right now, right? Um, but you got to make that time, you know, otherwise you'll, you'll be dragging around a cart with square wheels when you could be using circular wheels, you know, it'll take time to take it off and install the new wheel, but that time is time very, very well spent. Yeah. I like it. I like it. One of the, one of the biggest, um, um, time improvements, uh, I think you can make it, it's actually twofold. And it's something that you mentioned earlier is, and, and this is on the, it's on the visualization side specifically. And this is just from recent experience, but also from developing a lot of like just actual reports myself. Um, on the one, and, and it comes down to having a really strong visualization template 
that includes mm-hmm. the theming that you mentioned, the colors, how, what visualizations to show with what sort of data, how to fill out a report within certain gr- a grid pattern, um, how to have good labeling, just all of these like standards you can have. It saves so much time on the development side because the creative part of building reports can is honestly takes a can take a long time and everyone is not creatively inclined i've i I didn't i didn't know this you know i didn't know this until recently but not everyone can create Mm. a compelling looking report and um you know and and i'd even say it's 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 a very small portion who who actually can um we run what we call um enterprise dna challenges uh and uh every you know, there, there, we have a lot of great developers who who, who submit challenge entries, and, and I think we've got some of the best designed reports you could ever imagine in Power BI. Um, you know, with, within our um, catalog of, of 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 challenges, um, but it's amazing to see how many um, newbies who join our challenges really struggle on the visualization side. Great analytics, great insights, but it doesn't um, it doesn't really come through in how they've displayed it. They usually they they, they usually get better. But I think cutting down that time to get better and standardizing things across the board, you, I, I would say, is it could be a huge factor in the success of your just like general deployment of um of your of your your reporting strategies. Like, um, mm-hmm. you're just being able to save save a lot of time, get them done quicker, iterate faster, because you don't have to worry too much about the visualization side. Um, and then on the flip side, it also um, relates back to what you mentioned. It saves a lot of time for the consumer because they're not having to rewire their brains to figure out, okay, what is this? How is this person showing me this particular analysis? How do they want me to navigate through this report? Mm-hmm. So if you standardize all of that stuff, I mean, the, the time savings on both sides of the coin there are significant. Yeah, no, 100%, exactly. Um, so that's 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 a big one, and that that's one of the things that we're kind of obsessed about on the automation side is is can we automate in some ways how to create these great templates, or is there mm-hmm. just this? And this and this this is pro, this is quite Power BI related because that's you know that's our focus obviously, but um, you know how can we as an organization provide this offering or this service out so that others can um, jump over that hurdle quicker. You know, they don't have mm-hmm. to go and do that, do a lot of self-discovery and waste a lot of time to realize, okay, here's a great template. Let's just use this across everyone. So that, that's that's sort of one of the big things that we're we're we're, we're thinking a, a, a lot about, and I I would dare say would make a make a pretty big difference if we could solve it in some in some respects. Yeah, yeah, no, one hundred percent. I mean, make make it easier for remove all of the menial tasks from people's jobs. That way, they can stick to the intellectually stimulating ones. I think. Um, it can be a difficult slog to get that done, but it is something that drastic, it, it pays many dividends on, uh, you know, your analytics org, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the, what is, what are some of the other interesting things that you're, um, it's great to, you know, you've obviously got a presence online as well, which is, which is, which is really cool. Um, what are some of the other interesting things that you're coming across with your, um, you know, your net within your network and, and your profile out there? Yeah, so um, for anyone not aware, I have a YouTube channel on the side um, where basically the goal of it is to get people jobs in the world of analytics uh, and get people good jobs in the world of analytics. So, um, uh, you you know, a very core example of that is I'm surprised at the number of people who are offered $40,000 US um, in New York City to do data analyst work. And I tell them that's I mean, I'll just be blunt. That's just not a good salary for the type for this type of work. You know, uh, you should be paid a lot more, especially if you're being asked to do like SQL work and, um, you know, Python work and everything. Um, so after I found, I, I've been super lucky that I've never been a victim of such a, you know, like, like no one's offered me that little. Um, and so I want to make sure that I talk to as many people as possible and spread the word to as many people as possible that uh, there are standards, you know, there are standards you have to maintain for yourself. Uh, and there are standards in this industry, or there are standards that should exist in this industry, I should say, uh, for how much you pay for a person. If a person can't afford to pay them, you can't have a data analyst. Go figure it out, you know? Um, and I think that's really important. So it's, it's really important empowerment that I like to give people of like, you can ask for more or take the job, put the minimal effort in, and then go find a better job. Because if someone's paying $40,000 a year, they can only expect so much effort out of you, in my opinion. Um, again, in New York City, right? It, it depends on the region of the country you're in. There, maybe there is a region of the country where $40,000 makes sense. Um, 
you know, but uh, definitely not New York City. Yeah. So what, 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 why don't you plug, plug your YouTube channel? What, um, what, what how, how can people find you? Yeah. So I guess we'll link it in the show notes, but uh, it's Shashank Kalanathi. Um, so S H A S H A N as in Nancy K K A L A N as in Nancy I T H I. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it in the show notes, um, but uh, it is, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's really what I do. I, I just, I want people to get like good jobs in the industry and I want them to have the technical skills to, you know, be able to get those um, uh, or, or if they don't want that, you know, the great thing about, you know, if you know how to code and, uh, you know, create dashboards and stuff is you can go and get a six figure consulting job, um, uh, like freelancing, uh, freelancing is a better word for it. Um, and, you know, I mean, that kind of flexibility of options is only available to so many people on the planet, right? Where you can, you know, do whatever you want, wherever you want, uh, because of how great, the, how open this field is to remote work. Yeah, totally. I, I would, I, I look at that, if someone's throwing those sort of numbers out as well, I mean, there's a, there's a clear supply, um, there's a clear lack of supply of skills and talent in this area. So I'm, I'm surprised that uh, anyone can even get away with that. Um, I, yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, on job boards and things like that, you've, you've got so much competition. Mm-hmm. Um, for you know, within you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure like Microsoft and Amazon and and Google and 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 Facebook. I mean, they they the, they've got so many jobs going um, that you know they're they're taking they're soaking up a lot of the demand, right? So in in theory, everyone left over should be be still getting high salaries. Yeah, and you, I mean, you're 100 percent right, and and and. and I honestly, it surprises me. I have a feeling, and this is kind of, this is something that's really important to understand, right? Like, um, here's a great way to do it. So, you know, when I left college, right, I kind of assumed, for example, like, you know, as a, as a kid that um, all IT jobs paid well. That's not at all true at all. Not even in the slightest. There are many IT jobs that will pay close to minimum wage. Uh, and that's just the industry industry standard. So it's not even like a you know this, they should be paying this much and they pay this much. Like um, you know, I don't know what people's opinions are on minimum wage, but uh, the industry standard currently for many jobs is to pay you know basically nothing, like um, IT service desk stuff like that. You know, like um, uh, not like um, back end support and stuff like that. But I think in that way, in the data analytic in the analytics field, you do have people who can work on the really 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 low end of like very basic Excel reports and stuff like that. Maybe in that situation, it makes sense to pay someone that much. I'm not going to really give an opinion there. Um, the point I want to make to people is that in this field, there's so much opportunity up here. Um, here, you know, here's something to chew on, right? At least in the United States, right? Because I can only talk about the United States because I've only worked here, right? Um, everywhere I go, the number of H-1B people, um, so for anyone not familiar, H-1B uh, is the visa that people get in order to enter the country as a skilled worker. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy visa to get, and there's way more applications than there are spots available. Um, long story short, it exists because of a dearth of supply in the United States. Our education system does not produce enough qualified candidates for these jobs. Um, and you know, if you want some logic behind that, on average, it costs about twenty thousand dollars extra for a company to hire an H one B person because of all the you know hoops you have to jump at, jump through with the government and everything, and then you have to get visas approved. That's not even a, like a surefire thing. It's not like Canada, for example, where you know it can happen like that. Um, so the fact that like you know just anecdotally, you go anywhere, right? You'll start to see a lot of H one B people working in this industry. That says that there's a lot of demand and very little supply. Um, you know, because it's expensive to hire people from uh, other countries. It's expensive. It takes a lot of processing. Um, and so I think if you want to get into this industry, yeah, you're uh, at, especially at the mid to high end, there's so much opportunity. There's so much money to be made. I think if you want to get into it, like be a data analyst, right. And anyone can feel like if, on the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube comment section, feel free to like, correct me if you, if you think I'm wrong, I think you can get about up to $200,000, uh, TC total comp, um, total cash comp, um, from one of the big tech companies as a data analyst, um, so that's not your 401k or anything. I'm talking about the uh, base salary, stock options per year, or I'm um, sorry, RSUs per year, and the uh, your bonus. Uh, now, if you get into a data science position, I mean, I don't really see why you couldn't make seven, eight hundred thousand dollars as a senior, uh, like a se- like a, a principal, sorry, as a principal um, in these fields. So, I mean, as you can see, the you know salaries, you know, are all over the place in this industry. There's a lot of opportunity here. So. Yeah, definitely. And, and to me, a lot of that is a supply and demand, mm-hmm. balance, basically. Like there's just such a need for these skills. And, and that's, you know, that's, 
it's one of the trends that I would say that um, um, since enterprise DNA's um, infancy, we've been trying to target, right? This is like this massive skills gap and we're trying to yeah. um, upskill everyone with our, with our platform as, as, as quickly um, and effectively as we can. One of, one of the things I have to go back to, which, which put a smile on my face is when you, uh, when you said, um, I realized that you realized very quickly that not everyone in IT created a lot of, created a lot of value or, or uh, I, I think it was kind of that line. And I had to laugh because I, um, I actually never worked in IT. I was never actually an IT person when I worked in organizations. I was sort of, I've got a finance background mainly. Um, mm-hmm. And I worked sort of more front office, um, uh, like t- t- markets type um, roles. Um, but I was always very analytical, ba- analytically based. I, I brought a lot of analytical flavor to what I did. Um, but anyway, when I first started Enterprise DNA, I, I my experience with um, not everyone, but but a lot of IT areas is they did they they didn't all bring value. They they brought a lot of bureaucracy. That's yeah, like, that was that mm-hmm. was honestly what I felt um, when I but not being too experienced in in um, actually how how the IT teams actually work. So that was that I had to laugh. I had to laugh when you said that. I was surprised. I, I just assumed anyone that worked with computers get pay, gets paid a lot of money, um, and that's just not uh, true. As a small tangent over there. When people talk about the gutting of American um, uh, manufacturing, right? Yeah, this is kind of what they're talking about as well. Like they, uh, you know, like a lot of good-paying jobs um, for you know how whoever you decide to blame left the country, um, and they got replaced. You know, because obviously people still have to work, right? What did they get replaced with? Um, a lot of them got replaced with service jobs that are not as good as you think they are. Um, so just because someone is in an office doesn't mean it's a good job, you know, because that person might be paid ten dollars an hour. Whereas in a factory, they would have been paid twenty-five to fifty dollars an hour. Sure, it's you know physically more demanding, but they're literally being paid two and a half to five times as much uh, to work in a factory, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's something I, I I like to communicate that because I definitely came into the workplace very ignorant of the idea that not all office jobs are good jobs, um, you know, or high-paying jobs. Let's call it that, uh, high-paying jobs, right? And if you find yourself in a position like that, find a way to upskill. Find a way to learn how to do SQL, how to do Python, uh, Tableau, plug in my own YouTube channel. I have all those courses on my YouTube channel as well. Um, if you know all those skills and you can like, you, they, they give you the tool set to, and I love the way you uh, express it, Sam, to add value. You get paid a fraction of the value that you generate for a company. That's just how capitalism works. Someone hires you to generate value for them and they'll pay you a fraction of that value. So the easiest way to increase your salary is to generate 10X the value you want to make. If you want to make $100,000, generate a million dollars of value. Um, I think five is the conservative calculation people use, but you know, I was talking to this Deloitte consultant. He's like, nah, man, it's got to be 10X, man. Um, so, you know, he was very much a Deloitte consultant. There, there wasn't just consulting speak, was it? Yeah, it, it could have been. He, he was like very much like a Deloitte type of guy. That. Yeah, yeah. Him and um, there were some BCG guys I talked to that were like the, the same way. They're like, nah, man, 10, 20X, we'll, 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 do, we'll figure it out. I'm like, I mean, yeah, you do you, you know? <laughs> and then, we'll, but we'll be inside your business for three to four years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. They're, they're trying, to, trying, to, trying to do what we said we could do in six months. If anyone wants to see a funny video, look up uh, Steve Jobs. Um, hopefully, hopefully, we're drawing a few laughs out there from the listeners. Look up uh, Steve Jobs consultants on YouTube if you want to laugh. Um, the man always had an opinion on everything. So, yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, look, I mean, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it actually goes back to something you said right at the start. Um, that's that that you got from Scott Galloway is where you bring two unrelated things together. Uh, and, um, you know, that's where you can, uh, you know, you can r- really create some value out there. Right. And so I look at it, like, I would, I would dare say that the easiest path to increase your salary or increase your worth right at this point in time, um, with all of the trends that are happening in every single business right now is to bring an analytics, uh, bend to what you're doing to, mm-hmm. to bring an analytics focus, bring, oh. bring more data, um, you know, data related decision making into your into your <clears throat> routine, um, into your into your business area, into your business function. Um, to me, that is that, that that was actually really I would have to say what I did a lot myself um, within the businesses before I started um, Enterprise DNA a number of years ago. Um, you know, I I always thought, wow, you know, there's so much more we can be doing here, and I would dare say it is exactly the same right now in the majority of businesses out there. One hundred percent, I I think. It's not said enough, but you're 100% right. No matter what you do, there's some ability to add analytics to it to improve. 
the efficiency and efficacy of what you're doing. And uh, yeah, the value over there is uh, amazing. It's one of the reasons I love this field, right? Like I, I work, I, I've worked supply chains. I've worked digital uh, transformation. I'm working retail right now. You can take these skills and apply it to basically anything. I, you, you can go into any industry you want to, um, provided you're willing to like, you know, learn about the domain uh, because the skills are so transferable. And to an extent, data is data, you know, as long as you understand the business, data is data. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a beautiful field to be in right now. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, you wouldn't believe how many times, um, like it's like with 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 Power BI, right? Um, uh, data, it, it doesn't matter like where the data is coming from. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's actually all relatively the same. Like the the way that you analyze it is the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how not everyone sort of really believes that though. Like when we're creating training content or education content, everyone feels like they want everything to be ultra specific to their industry or. Um, their business because they think it's different but the the reality is yes okay there are some differences there are some slight differences but the whole uh, sort of technique uh, techniques that you use to actually get high quality data output um, high quality reports are actually very similar no matter what data you work with and so I try and reiterate that as much as possible and I think um, you know here's another good opportunity to to, to really do that like it's so transferable um, the skill it's, it's really just just getting the skill set getting the creativity the analytical creativity going and you can you can do um, analysis on any data you can create fantastic um, report value driven reports on any, on anything and I would actually argue that's a better mentality to go forward with it with, right? Um, there's a great book I read a while ago called Range, Why Generals Su um, Succeed in a, a Increasingly, um, what is it called? Like specialized world. Uh, long story short, right? There are two types of, there are two types of ways you can make it uh, become successful, right? Just broadly speaking, you can either LeBron James, right? LeBron James was just an insane athlete. Like no matter how hard I worked, I, if I was at the gym every day, 24 hours a day, I would, I don't have the genetics to be, as good as LeBron James, it does not matter how hard I try. Um, there are some people who can focus all their efforts on one thing and they can be so good at that one thing. They can be so top tier at that one thing. Um, and that in, in athletics, it's even harder, right? Because it's not even like I'm the best fortune 500 CEO where it's like, there are 10 different things you have to be good at to like be good at it. It's like, this is a very exacting thing, basketball, right? Um, with exacting rules, right? Um, that's one way to do it, right? But that's not the way that'll work for 99.9% .9 of us. So not, most of us just don't have the genetics to be that. I mean, and at that point, it's just genetics, really. Like, I mean, obviously hard work and everything, but, you know, I mean, you've seen LeBron's body. The guy, the man's a, a monster, you know? Um, the better way is kind of like what you said, right? You, you want to learn these generalized skills and apply them in creative ways. That's why you want to learn the generalized skills, the generalized, like you want to obviously learn the uh, analytical techniques of your industry, but then you'll just be doing what everyone else is doing anyways. You're not going to be special in any way. By learning these many different techniques, you can start saying like, oh, we use this thing in healthcare. Maybe that'll make sense over here. Tremendous example. If you want to know where, um, how to make explainable models, go and see what uh, financial institutions are doing. In the, in the United States, if you want to give out a loan, right? The loan process for giving it out is very automated. Um, your machine learning model has to be extremely explainable. And uh, I think it's a FINRA. FINRA will like, you know, break down your office doors and be like, okay, explain exactly how this thing works. Why did this person get a loan? Why did this person not get a loan? Um, because the US government is very, very concerned with making sure that, you know, loans are distributed well, uh, regardless of, you know, uh, maybe not class, but like uh, race, gender, stuff like that, right? Um, yeah. and, and, you know, like we're, we're trying to make explainable models at Nordstrom. Um, obviously there's not nearly a, um, such a high bar for us to get that done, but, you know, looking at what JP Morgan Chase does, we got some ideas. We're like, oh, okay. These guys are like the mat, like, you know, financial people are like the masters of explainable models because they have to be like legally speaking, you know, um, yeah, like, like, really you know, there's so much regulatory stuff. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I actually read that range book as well. Um, a couple of years back and, to be honest, I did come out of it a little bit confused, but, mm -hmm. um, because it, it's it's hard to totally agree with everything that he said. But what I guess one of the biggest things that uh, that that you got out of it, the, whole, the premise of the book really was that he was trying to, or, or they were the researchers were trying to um, have an opposed opinion on the ten thousand hours rule. Yes, where, yes. Um, there's this you know, folklore of like, everyone should play, do, do something for 10,000 hours and you'll be amazing. Like um, Roger Federer or like Tiger Woods or, or mm -hmm. LeBron, right? And their, their theory was 
you know, you're better to actually, they go and they gave a lot of examples and supporting documentation that it's actually better to be a, a generalist earlier mm -hmm. on and then bring a different approach to something um, later on in life. Um, and then you've got a higher chance of success than just putting all your eggs into one basket and doing it for 10,000 hours. So that was kind of like the crux of what I, I got right. out of that book. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's trying to put something a, a too simple a theory on on a very you know complex you know because there is you know, right if, if you're genetically um uh you know genetically you are more aligned to do something well or like maybe the ten thousand hours of work for you rather than you know if you're if you're a jock and you're you're trying to be a um, a rocket scientist or something like you know it's, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult like yeah, uh, it, it, it's hard to, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot more variation um, than, than maybe that book particularly said. But anyway, that's it. That's for sure, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there is definitely someone out there who's even potentially better than LeBron, like just, you know, genetically speaking, we just don't know who they are. Because, a, a you know, the book kind of glosses over this. A lot of it is just like, you know, what did you try when you were really young, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, but that's totally fair. I feel like, uh, you know, you, you got to say something to sell the book, right? So <laughs> that's how they you know, make it really simple so you can sell it. And then I found, um, I'm a big reader, but I, I will definitely say a lot of books sound like they say in 10,000 words, something that could be said in a hundred, you know? Um, um, yeah. That's, that's why um, services like Blinkist are so popular. I, I need to try it out, but yes, it sounds like a really, really good idea. Yeah, well, I mean, it's so popular because I've got it. I've got Blinkist because you just get the summarized version. You get the you get the key points out of it. But I think, I, I, I don't disagree. I think that, that the 10,000 hours you know, I, I, I remember my, my dad telling me about that, like when, when I was growing up and it was sort of like, um, gospel, you know, in terms of, if you want to be good at something, you got to do like 10,000 hours, but it, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an opposing view to that because there there's lots of ways that you can get to somewhere and be like really successful. There's lots of examples where people haven't, um, done one thing in their life and, um, done lots of different things. And then all of a sudden, um, approached, uh, a, problem or approach to field in a totally different way and um absolutely dominated it you know so uh, i i think there's there, there's many um quality reasons why you you can have opposing you know um paths to success and i mean i would even argue that you know probably most incredibly traditionally successful people uh, who are not athletes right because again um athletics is something that can be optimized for uh like for a specific sport or something right um you know, like your gates, your jobs, you know, stuff like that. A lot of them are generalists, you know, um, jobs did not create wind or jobs did not become the software mogul of the eighties through the nineties because he was the best pro computer programmer in existence. Like he, he probably wrote up very little code in relation to windows. Actually, um, jobs was not the preeminent artist of our generation. It was a bunch of different things that came together, you know, uh, that created a confluence of factors that were applied in a very creative and, and intelligent way to create a you know tremendous business opportunity, um, or even like you know just being very very talented. Uh, celebrities are a good example. Just being very very talented at singing does not make you um, uh, Adele. You know you need to have stage presence. You need to have uh, uh, like a story, a personality, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 and I think that's kind of why I like the book, you know, especially like, you know, uh, I love my parents. There was th that attitude of like, you know, like be like hyper-specialized at this thing was one that very much per like pervaded my household. Um, and then reading this, I was kind of like, okay, you know what, like try out a couple of different things, kind of see where you stick and like, you know, the Scott Galloway method, find two things that you stick well at, and then, you know, get good at those two things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And look, if we, if we, if we relate this, if relate, relate this back to a business entity, right? Like you can, you can look at the analytics function as that, that, that creative outlet where mm -hmm. you can um, try and find your, um, your advantage through, um, through the, the answers that you find in your analysis and within, within that data, within your raw material sitting within your, within your business. Um, and, you know, I think if you, if you can bring that innovation, that, cr that, that creativity to how you approach this part of, part of your business, you know, you can find those, those insights that are going to make a big difference in a, in a, in a multitude of ways in various different uh, areas of your business. So that's a nice way to, I think, um, relate it back to, you know, our, our core discussion here around, around data and around analytics. Yeah. Well, I think. 
I think we've probably gone over time. I, I don't even know when we started, <laughs> but um, I, I just enjoyed it. I just enjoyed chatting. Uh, I had a great time. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't we, why don't we round off? Why don't we round off? Um, thanks so much for, um, um, for, for chatting away today. I, I, I can tell you're a real sort of expert in the field and, and doing some um, great stuff out there um, within, within your network. Um, do you want to maybe just, just, just um, plug like a bit more about some of the things that you do on the side if, 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 if people want to reach out to you? Yeah. So if you want to reach out to me, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, and uh, YouTube's probably, YouTube comment section is probably the you know, easiest way to get to me. Um, my channel is all about teaching you what you need to know to break into the world of analytics. I have a free course on Python, on SQL, um, Tableau, machine learning, uh, and probably something else that I forgot. Um, so feel free to check it out over there. They're all great ways to get primed on the subject before um, you, know, you decide to break into the world. I do a live stream every Thursday at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Um, that's, uh, what 11 AM uh, Eastern United States time. And, uh, that's a great place to reach me again and ask very specific questions about the industry if you're, uh, if you are so inclined, but, uh, thank you so much for having me on Sam. Pleasure. Pleasure. No, awesome. Awesome to have you on and, um, really enjoyed our discussion. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of, um, a lot of value that the, that the listeners got out of this one. So yeah, really appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Thank you. 